I'm Amber Campbell. I'm the Project Manager for Great Plains Grazing, and today I'm going to introduce you Dr. Brian Arnall. He is in Plant and Soil Sciences at Oklahoma State University, and he will be presenting on Enrich Strips and Green Seeker Technology. And with that, I'm going to let Brian have control. All right. Thank you, Amber. Uh, I'll have my chat group up. So, uh, Folks, uh, most of you guys know me. Uh, there's a few new ones out there I'm not familiar with, but uh, feel free to uh, type in the chat box and I'll answer as we go. And also, if we happen to lose audio somewhere along the way, uh, we'll be done with this well, well before our time's out. Uh, to some of you, this isn't uh, new technology, uh, but it, it's still an important technology. And while I'm going to focus on wheat and you're going to hear a lot of grain uh, talk, uh, that's just well, that's what I have slides in, guys. That's what we have data in. However, this works well <coughs> for uh, dual purpose and graze out wheat. We've been using it in those systems for about 10 to 12 years. And we've been working quite a bit in eastern Oklahoma with Bermuda grass and uh, seeing some very promising results. So while you're going to hear a lot about wheat, uh, don't, don't think I'm not talking about uh, grazing systems also for dual purpose pasture and uh, Bermuda grass. Um, here we go. Okay, so uh, this is um, just just a reminder why why I go with this and why I talk about you know um, the importance of proper fertility. Uh, you know, while we focus a lot on nitrogen, you know, this is everything I want to be focusing on is nitrogen. We make an assumption when we utilize technologies like the enriched strip and green seeker sensor that your pH is good and your P and K is taken care of. We've got to make sure the entire system is good as a whole. We can't be going out there and trying to increase productivity if our soil pH is at a 4.2 or 4.3. So, you know, remember the system. Don't get lost on some of the little things. Nitrogen rate doesn't matter if our, our phosphorus is in the tank. So, you know, keep everything in mind. Keep your goal at hand and know where you're going. <coughs> For me. Uh, just one of those nice factors that... You know, if you're in my nutrient management course, you have to memorize this slide set before the end of the semester. This is worth a significant amount of your points. And I make the students do that because nitrogen in nutrient management terms is the essential and most challenging nutrient to get to. It's our largest input as far as inputs go. Uh, next to land and fuel, nitrogen is typically number one. And then we get into the fact that it's, it's a challenging inside diverse system. You know, you, you start with organic matter. And in a pasture system, your organic matter is greatly, uh, significantly higher than in a conventional till wheat system. So you have more of that running. Um, you know, for every 1% organic matter we're working with, there's 2,000 pounds of nitrogen in the top six inches for every 1%. Now, that 2,000 pounds of nitrogen, it's not available all the time. It's only as it breaks down and goes forward. So in any given year, we're releasing you know, 10 to 40 pounds of nitrogen in the Southern Great Plains. At the same time, there are scenarios where we can tie up a significant amount of nitrogen. Um, let's say following wheat harvest, you incorporate the straw and it starts raining. You can see nitrate values drop anywhere between 60 and 100 pounds of N per acre with that incorporation of straw and needing a breakdown. We have a few additions uh, up in the green. We have a few blue areas which is our pools, and organic matter can be blue also. The yellow is the important thing. The yellow is what really gets us. <coughs> uh, ammonia volatilization. For those on a high pH soil, uh, northwest Oklahoma, southwest Oklahoma, Texas high plains, western Kansas, we get into high pH soils. Anywhere where a pH is above 7, we're applying nitrogen to the soil surface, i.e. no-till, pasture, etc. We can have losses through ammonia and volatilization. Denitrification over here on this side, this N2O, NO, and N2, this is where we have water standing in periods of time. So now we're talking about eastern uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. We're talking about terraces in western and central uh, Great Plains. Anywhere water stands for more than um, five to ten days, you're going to have nitrogen going up through gas. And then down here we have leaching. You know, any well-drained soil, a sand, um, anything that gets water, any nitrogen and nitrate form with water flows through the system, water flows, nitrate flows out of the system. <clears throat> and the one that gets us in the southern Great Plains, more so than any other loss factor, 
is this little plant loss right there. That 10 to 80 kilo per hectare, guys and gals, that is equivalent to uh, 8 to about 76 pounds of nitrogen per acre in a winter wheat crop. Our plants that grow on the southern Great Plains that can handle stress, that can handle drought, those things that we're looking for in this project, when a plant is able to grow, especially wheat, wheat will uptake all the nutrients, all the water it can in the desirable time frame and load it into the system. However, if we experience drought and heat during flag leaf or during early reproductive stages in, in many of our grasses, we can gas off a significant amount of nitrogen because it's trying to unload its system. It has luxury consumed, and now that, that ammonium that's in its system is becoming toxic, and it has to give it off as a gas as ammonia. So we can see, especially in our territory, significant amount of losses due to overconsumption of nitrogen. And that overconsumption comes from, you know, you put on too much nitrogen, more than the crop needs. It takes it up in luxury, stores it, and then it gets lost. <coughs> nitrogen is historically determined upon yield goal. You know, we do it whether it's um, tons of forage, um, pounds of beef, bushel per acre, yield goal in the last three years average plus 20 to 30 percent is our typical. Um, yield goals are better than a random guess, but yield goals are still significantly poor. Um, it's just tough. We are in a region, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, we can't guarantee rain. If we aren't under irrigation, our yield range goes from zero to 100. It doesn't matter what crop you're in. You, you can have the opportunity for all of them. So how can we do a yield goal? How can we estimate yield if it isn't consistent from one year to the next? It's better than a random guess, but there are still big gaps that we can take advantage of in the nitrogen system. Leads me to the next graph. So this is uh, Lahoma Long-Term Fertility Study. This is west of Enid by about 20 miles, so north central Oklahoma, uh, very productive ground, high, highly fertile soils. Um, any OSU uh, extension specialist that's been around for more than two years has probably seen this graph. Um, the yellow bar is where uh, there's been no nitrogen applied since 1971. The blue bar is where it gets nitrogen 100 pounds of in every single year. What you see is the average yields, and these are yields, the average yields are all over the board. From 2003, 2004 harvest, you know, we're up near 90 bushel, no 9, 90 bushel. Um, in 2007, we're at 40. We have a 2x swing in yield. But here's the kicker, that nitrogen use. If you look right here in 2007, that 100 pounds of nitrogen gained us about 6 bushel. Prices in 07 were okay, but they spiked. And in 2008, when the nitrogen uh, uh, prices just went off the chart, we gained 10 bushel from 100 pounds of nitrogen. Yet the next year, we doubled our yield from 40 to uh, 86 bushel by 100 pounds of nitrogen. It's that we don't know, A, we don't know what the yield's going to be. B, we don't know how much nitrogen we're going to need. If we look at our optimum nitrogen rate on those same plots, dry land wheat yields, because um, we have a range of end rates we can look at. You go back from 1970, actually 71 and 72, the optimum nitrogen rate was zero. Why? It was it was um, let's see it was um, on there as you know, the 1971, 1972, sorry about that, guys. We, I was looking at the chat box for a second. Um, 1971 to 1972, we did not have, um, that's organic matter breaking down. And so there was no need for additional nitrogen in those three years. Broken out of the prairie, you have uh, nitrogen released from the system, and you, you get those yields. But if we go on and you look at, okay, so let's go back to the last 10 years or 12 years. From 2002, 2012, we only, <clears throat> 2002, 2012, we have ranges from anywhere between zero and 01 up to 100 pounds in four and five. 
and we look closer in the last 10 years, 24 to 2013, the yield is all over the board. We have yields near um, 100 bushel, so this is about 86, 90 bushel in 2008, uh, 76 bushel in 2009, and again in 14 we cut somewhere around 60 bushel. The end needs, if you note, there is no correlation between yield goal or yield and nitrogen demand. Why? Because the system changes. The system which is either providing or taking nitrogen away from us changes every single year, which is why we get into the Green Seeker sensor, which what everybody's logged on to. <coughs> we're going to go through, we're going to talk about the enriched strip first, and then sensor-based nitrogen rate calculator uh, using the Green Seeker sensor, and then I'll touch upon VRT depending on how the time goes and, and where we look at it there. Just so you guys see, um, uh, the, the old extension specialist out there will remember these old stick sensors. Heavily is all get out. You had to use uh, IPAC, HP IPAC. Uh, you'd forget from year to year how to use it. About three years ago, oh, she worked with Trimble to come out with something much more simplistic to use. Only about $495 versus the five grand of this sensor. And this little thing, you know, we've got it out across Oklahoma and getting it into Kansas and Texas. Very useful, very friendly. Does not save data, but it carries a lot easier. And and when I'm in a field, I'm either carrying an iPad or a cell phone because everything we can do is online. So we can take one of these, I can take one of these handhelds out there and in about five to ten minutes from stepping into a field, I can have a nitrogen rate ready for that producer to go. So what are we basing off of? Um, we're following nature's lead. Anybody that's been in a cattle production system at some point in time has seen cowpox. Those green spatches that you see across the field, uh, the benefit of organic decomposition and, and, and uh, deposition of urea from liquid or the ammonium from our solids that go out from grazing cattle. <coughs> in essence, if you see this in a field, just fertilize. Cowpox means you're losing forage production, which means you're losing gain and you're losing grain. It is time to put out nitrogen fertilizer one way or the other. We just made bigger cowpox by turning into strips. They are nice. What they tell us in these strips is, do I need or do I not need nitrogen? Won't tell me how much, but I promise you, checking a field at 40 to 50 miles an hour, driving by that field, if you see that green strip out there, you know it's time to fertilize, period. Call a co-op, <clears throat> call your <coughs> fertilizer dealer, whoever it is, <coughs> pardon me, and get fertilizer on the field. So, you know, how do we do these enriched strips? You know, the enriched strip, we want to put, it, it's a strip of nitrogen applied in a field. These strips should be a minimum of 10 foot wide by, let's say, 300 feet long. So, three yards by 100 yards is about right. I like to see them wider and I like to see them longer, but it's all about the location you're in. Most of our crops, uh, winter wheat, I want to see 30 to 40 pounds of nitrogen, corn 50 to 60, sorghum 40 to 50, Bermuda grass up to 100 pounds of nitrogen in Bermuda grass pre-plant or before spring green up, pasture in that 30 to 40 range. Um, I like to go where it's representative or break it out in zones. If you've got a good piece of ground and a bad piece of ground in the same field, Put one at both of those fields. It doesn't have to be large. Uh, for winter crops, I want before, so winter canola, winter wheat, I want it to go in the ground before planting or about 30 days after sowing. Summer crops, it needs to be pre-plant or soon after. Forages, I prefer Bermuda grass and our, our, our summer warm season forages to go on early spring, right at green up so it's there for the entire season. Some of our fall forages, you can either put it on in the winter or coming on into the summer. Basically your normal fertilization time for our summer grasses and winter grasses. <clears throat> How do we apply? All kinds of methods. This is, doesn't even show them all. Uh, one of the most common that we get for anybody that does a lot is the ATV with the 25 gallon tank. This has uh, streamer bars. You can use streamer nozzles, flat fans, whatever you want. 20 gallon tank and a one gallon per minute pump. Uh, this was down in the south central Oklahoma 
where you put a, um, you know, they've got a tank in the back of the truck, a little receiver hitch, and three flood nozzles for his enriched drips. This is actually a highway applicator um, added to a bar so they could do liquid uh, and 10 foot strips with this liquid tank. Spinner spreaders do most of Oklahoma. I should have added, guys, in the state of Oklahoma, we have anywhere between 500,000 and 600,000 acres of enriched strips in any given year. Uh, most of them are going out with the spinner spreader. Some of them in our wheat ground are using anhydrous rigs and just running a second pass on pre-plant. Liquid rigs are getting more common. Uh, while this is a pull type, the self-propelled sprayers, they are just running the middle boom, the middle section. So you're talking about 14, 15 foot wide and doing it that way. Gaining popularity is the Atwood Special Push Spreader. Uh, this is a drop. I think it's better if you do the spinner type spreader. Um, a lot of people just trying to figure out if they want to do end right strips are using something like this. And then the original, which we had some producers still using today, is the Joska. They just go out. They don't get 10 foot wide and they don't get 100 meters long, but they go out and they make a cow patch, a, a cow pox and um, go through there and just watch it. If you are not sure, if all you got is a plastic cup, uh, if you want a red Solo cup or what be it, get a little bit of fertilizer and put it out there in a patch and see what happens. You don't have to pile it up, just see what happens. And if it turns green, you've got an interest strip and you need to fertilize. So moving on from strips, if you guys have any questions about interest strips, please, please ask. Uh, or contact me later. Uh, you're, you'll hear me talk about SBNRC. That is the sensor-based nitrogen rate calculator. This is on our on our online calculator. So the strip gives us a yes or no. That's all it does. Doesn't give us any extra or any less. It's just yes or no. And the SBNRC allows us to put numbers to those readings and make something real of it. You know, Dave Mingle. Uh, years ago did uh, some great work in sorghum to look at, okay, how good is yield goal and soil test nitrogen and getting the right rate, and then how good is a SBNRC for sorghum de developed by OSU and K-State? Well, the pre-plant soil test and a yield goal had an accuracy of about 34, 35 pounds of nitrogen per acre. That means you were plus or minus 34 pounds of N per acre of getting about the right rate. You know, this is it's in that range. So soil testing, that's on a, a summer crop. That's on a crop that you only have to get, figured out what's going on in the system for about 120 days. While on a wheat crop or a pasture crop, you've got something growing. You've got the environment acting upon it for, you know, 250 plus days. The green seeker sensor in the sorghum was plus or minus 10 pounds. We in wheat I put that number, we're plus or minus about 20, 25 pounds of in from being the right rate for winter wheat. That's on a 40 bushel wheat crop. We're plus or minus six pounds of being right with the enriched strip and SBNRC of getting the right rate. That's a typical 18 to 19 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year that we're getting either right or high or lower. We're improving it one way or the other. Now, we'll talk about algorithms later. So what do we need for this calculator? Well, we need a response index. That's basically how much greener is that enriched strip over the farmer practice. We are using a yield prediction because we at OSU and K-State truly believe that is what gains us the most accuracy. If we can in season figure out where the yield is going to be, that helps us with nitrogen rate recommendation. Then nitrogen removal, it's a standard number. We'll move through that. Our calculation in the end looks like nitrogen rate equals the potential without nitrogen times RI and then times N in the grain and NUE. So that yield potential of the farmer practice times RI. Let's say your RI is 1.2. And we get RI by dividing the value from the enriched strip from the farmer practice. So 1.2 means there's a 20% increase in the enriched strip over the farmer practice. And we look at the yield potential of our farmer practice, the area outside that strip and multiply that by RI. And we're, we're really looking at the difference. And, and what got left off this slide that should be in there is the yield potential of the farmer practice times RI minus yield potential farmer practice. And you'll, I'll explain that a little bit better right up here. 
Um, RI goes back to these red bars. These red bars describe how responsive the crop was in that year. So we go from years in 01 and 06 where we have a 5 to 10 percent increase in yield due to nitrogen. And then in years like 09, 04, and in 05 or 94, where we are tripling to quadrupling yield due to nitrogen. In 09, you see right here, 25 bushel without, 70 with. We're tripling nitrogen or we're tripling yield with 100 pounds of nitrogen. The green seeker, what it's doing to give us these numbers to, to, to help figure out our annual prediction is it's emitting narrow infrared and red light actively, which means we can sense 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with the exception of having dew or rainfall. Light and water don't play well together, so we have to make sure we have a dry crop. Um, we're looking at these two areas, the red right here and the near infrared over here. So the yellow line is from poor, sickly wheat. The orange line is from strong, healthy wheat. Notice orange is strong. Um, so in the red region, which measures photosynthetic potential, the good wheat, the good plant, is absorbing more of the red light, so it's reflecting less. The higher you get on this, the more it's reflected. However, NIR, which has, uh, is a more active wavelength, has more energy involved in it, is damaging to plant cells. A healthier plant will reflect more than a sick plant. So we're using photosynthetic potential by plant health, and in overall, it gives us a very good estimator, this is how we calculate NVI, a very good estimator of plant size and vigor. And so with that, we plant, we sense some here mid-season, and we project out the yields with and without nitrogen and back calculate the difference. Um, most say, well, you can't predict yield. Well, I say we can in winter wheat. Uh, this graph right here, where the green diamonds is the yield for that year, and the red squares are the sensor readings from the first week of February. Now, in a typical system, I am going to sense more than just once, or I'm going to watch that crop from, from November up through harvest and even after that for the interest trip. This data all comes from one sensing region, which is that first week of February. You'll see that in 2008, and this is actually wrong, we had in 2003 this value, we did predict the 85 up there, so I apologize for that, that miss up there. In both 03 and 08, we predicted record yields. In 03, that was my first year, the highest grain ever taken from Lahoma was 60 bushel, yet if we move that up to where it actually was, we predicted 96 bushel and cut about 89 bushel. Um, amazingly to tell the difference. And we have years in 09, we, we predicted the low in 10 and 12. Years where we underpredict the first week of February typically happens when we're dry up through February and get a late February rain, so something happens. So if I'm a producer, I'm coming back and measuring it again and I'm getting it right. But for this graph, everything is at one date. Here's some nice things about being able to predict yield. Not only does it help us with nitrogen rate, because this is replacing yield gold. If I'm a, a wheat producer looking at what I'm going to do with a crop in February, making plans for fungicide, herbicide, what be it, if I can go out there and say, okay, I've got a 90 bushel potential or I have a 25 bushel potential, that probably tells me what I'm going to do for vacation and how much I'm going to worry about that wheat crop. If I'm down here, I'm walking away. I'm wiping my hands, walking away, I'm going to go have a nice vacation. If I've got 90 bushel potential in February, I'm probably going to do my best to protect that potential and do my best to uh, keep it in that 90 bushel range. So when we're actually at sensing, um, people want me to tell them when to sense. The correct answer is when you see the strip. I've sensed 10th of November. I've sensed the 10th of March. They all work. You just need to see the difference in the strip and the non-strip. You sense both. We enter planning date and NDVI into the online calculator. Behind the scenes, we look at yield prediction and RI, and we get the nitrogen rate. That looks like this. So in this case, we sense a strip. We sense a farmer practice. We predict the farmer practice is going to be 40 bushel. 
with the RI, RI we put in there, we predict that with fertilizer we're going to make 70 bushel. That means we have a 30 bushel difference between unfertilized and fertilized. And this is generic, this isn't the right math, but generic. We'd use a two pounds of M per bushel and recommend 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So we're going in, in season, say what can we make with, what can we make without, less fertilized for the difference. Using two pounds of M per bushel, we can get it there. And we're extremely accurate on this. All these are available online. We have the sensor-based nitrate calculator on the NUE web. So if you Google NUE, you will be there. Uh, you click on this little box with the TI calculator. You click through there, and you're going to find we now have 33 algorithms. You're going to find pages that are purple from where we've worked with K-State, Dave Mingle, and Ray Espedito. We've worked with Ray quite a bit on a joint wheat project. Uh, Ray and Dave Mingles worked on the, the sorghum work, so we have a lot of purple integrated into our orange system here. But we're running 33 algorithms. Uh, the primary, though, is winter wheat, um, and we have the sorghums uh, are some of our bigger ones. We're working on canola and updating Bermuda grass right now with help of our educators in eastern Oklahoma. This is what the calculator would look like. You put in uh, English units for those Okies, you'd choose within Oklahoma. For those outside of Oklahoma, you have to enter in the days were from growing degree days greater than zero. So this isn't like corn where we have cumulative heat units. This has every day the plant's been able to grow. So your number won't get above about 120. Most of it's going to be between 80 and 100 when you want to be sensing. If you're within Oklahoma, use a mesonet from within Oklahoma. You put in your farmer practice, NDVI, enriched strip, Max yield, I want this number to be huge. If you grow 40 bushel wheat, put on 100 bushel. Um, expected grain price, just some quick economics. In this case, this scenario RI is 1.39, meaning you're going to increase yield by 40% if you fertilize. From uh, uh, YP without fertilizer of 32, yield prediction width is 45. Um, we've got 30 pounds of M per acre recommended. This would be some gross returns based upon the economics of dollars per bushel and dollars per pound of N. 44 per acre versus 186 per acre. That only takes in the cost of fertilizer and price of grain, nothing else. We usually just use this when the recommendations are that 5 to 10 pounds of nitrogen per acre, see if it's worth running over it. So um, I should put on here. If you guys have questions, want to see more, if you go to my YouTube channel, which is uh, OSU MPK uh, YouTube, I've got uh, 101s on how to apply enriched strips, and then, uh, you know, user how to sense the strips and put the readings into the online calculator. Um, I'll have those links up here in a little bit. Some of our research just to show, sorry, I scrolled through the wrong direction, how we've, how uh, this stuff has been working, you know, like a lot of wheat stuff here. Uh, looking at some uh, large scale systems where we had 60 foot plots by 300, 60 by 3 to 500 feet, uh, using enriched strips to do a flat rate. This is not BRT, this is just flat rate. Um, used the producer's combine, we used a way wagon, uh, went across the state, and we had quite a few areas for this. The end game is that we were able to improve NUE, the farmer practice NUE over two years in 14 sites was 22%. Uh, the NUE of the sensor was 27%. Not good, but we improved. Our protein levels were good. We maintained protein levels above 12. Our yields were actually one bushel better, and our end rate overall was 19 pounds less. What you'll see is overall we'll cut nitrogen. On a field-by-field -field basis, we will increase yield sometimes, sometimes we won't change it. If you look at this in rate 60, 49, we dropped, in this case, 60 and 72, we increased nitrogen on this site, uh, decreased, increased, decreased. So it's not like we're cutting nitrogen every single time. It is we are putting nitrogen where it's needed. Had a producer in northwest Oklahoma. He did 10 fields of wheat. His typical top dress is 55 pounds of N. He got done with his 10 fields. He averaged 55 pounds of N per acre, actually 54. But he went from one field needing zero to another field needing 100. So he used the same amount of N over a large area. He just redistributed it to the fields that needed it 
and not to those that didn't. Um, so the economics at 11 out of our 14 sites, the sensor was better. Guys will win majority of the time, but we, you know, we win, win all the time. It's agriculture and it's not perfect. Uh, using uh, wheat at four, five dollars and nitrogen at 40 cents. You know, when I did this, this was years ago when I first did these slides, uh, the prices went up and luckily I can use the same slide from 2010 uh, again because you know, wheat prices stink. Um, overall site years, SBNRC end rate was 19 pounds less than farmer practice with equal yield. So average saving was dependent upon end price. Six of 14 site years, SBNRC recommended more. Five out of 14 protein was affected by method. Of those three times farmer practice was better, twice uh, SBNRC was better. So not always was farmer getting better protein. Sometimes we improved it, but it's about a 50-50 shot on who would do best on protein. Corn, we do well on corn. Uh, we can save a lot of money on corn. I'm going to move through this since this is a grazing. What I like to tell people is that sensor technology is very much like no-till. That there's no one cookie cutter recipe. There's no textbook. You learn from your neighbors, but adopt from your farm. You know, we've got producers that from the very southwest in Gould to the very northeast in Ottawa County, uh, out to the panhandle under irrigated corn conditions and irrigated wheat. Um, that run the sensors, but everyone has a different adaptation. Some are all graze out, some are dual purpose, some are green only, some are high rotation. You've just got to figure out how it works for you. Don't go all in in the first year expecting to use a green seeker on every acre, but man, put an enrich strip on every single acre you have, whether it's wheat or forages, it will make you money every single year. You adopt it to your farm, soil machinery, and management mindset. Again, don't go 100%. There is an art form to this sensor setup. Just want to show you guys, enriched strips are highly visible from highways. Uh, consultants, I had a consultant one year, made some, some signs. These same plaque, placard board, same plastic vinyl pieces of paper, he used like $2 of the thing. He had his name and it said nitrogen strip with his number. He put out 2,000 acres, or about 1,000 acres of enriched strips his first year. Because of those signs in the strip showing up on the highway, his second year he had almost 20,000 acres he consulted on with just the enriched strip because of a $2 plastic sign. If we're an extension, guys, I, I will change that and I'll put K-State on it and make it purple. I don't care. I will buy these signs for you if you put out the strips. Uh, for the OSU guys, I've got a pile of them. For K-State guys, I'll turn three letters, put, add a K and put them into purple, and I'll get you signs. Anybody from TAMU, I can change the colors to that. So these are easy enough to do. I change the website, enter it strip. They're highly visible. Um, they're easy use, and they're great advertisement for extension. We do have updates. We can go beyond just the handheld sensor. As you see this, we have sensors on a front boom. You can also mount sensors on the back. These will do VRT, changing by its own, very, um, very good. The prices are coming down. Um, we don't have a lot of them in this country yet, but they're, they're gaining popularity. We have about half a dozen or so running. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't push hard on these VRT systems. I have one for demo, which I put out in many of our counties. And if you want me to come out, I actually need two fields this year to, to demo the VRT and the flat rate. This is my little VRT rig. It's a 30-foot sprayer, 200-gallon tank, put on the Green Seeker system, do VRT. I did two fields last year, uh, two sites, one in Ottawa County, one in a major county. Uh, I'm looking for two more, two to four more locations for this week go-around. OSU educators send me a note. The VRT, um, you know, we can easily do the enrich strip as zones where you do your good ground and bad ground and do a flat rate for each, or the RT200, which is this right here. This is called the RT200, where you have multiple sensors taking a reading. Um, I just like this graph. This is an older graph. Right in the middle of this field running up and down, there was a fence line two years before this, this NDVI map was taken. You can see how the two fields were treated differently. The blue ground is really poor growing crop. The green is better. Uh, the left-hand side was a lot better looking crop than the right-hand side and it needed more nitrogen. 
green seeker, uh, just some more pictures. I like pictures, so you guys are going to see what some of the VRT stuff looks like. There are sensors mounted on the sprayer. Um, here's drop nozzles using those six sensor setup. Uh, this is a liquid system, so injecting into corn or sorghum, you can run this easily and do this across the field. Here's it on an anhydrous system. Uh, you can tell he's pushing up a little bit of gas, needs to be a little bit drier, but you can run it either easily with anhydrous. High-end technology, this is not commercially available, but we were doing two foot by two foot resolution or six inch of row back in 2003. We've got the capability, we have the technology, the cost just isn't there yet. And you see how we're using the sensor and actually putting over every single row. We got drop nozzles and we angle these nozzles down. So this was put nitrogen, just like some of those high-end um, sprayers that are out there today. This was put nitrogen within two inches of the, the row. Dr. Ron made that. You guys from OSU would like that. Uh, some of our equipment over the years. Oh, that slide didn't go. Uh, we've gone from, you know, the old John Deere with 10 foot at one point, we had a 60-foot sprayer where we had a sensor over every nozzle, moving down to a little bit smaller, more manageable units. Um, and I'm going to go through this. I want to leave plenty of time if anybody may or may not have um, had an opportunity to ask questions. Um, here's all my contact. Uh, the YouTube channel, if you go to YouTube, OSU MPK, and you look at my videos, like I said on there, there's a video, short video, about how to apply inert strips, and there's a short video about how to sense inert strips and put them into calculators. Through Oklahoma, the inert strip technology, regardless of the crop, is an NRCS equip project. Missouri, same thing. Kansas, we're working on it, not quite there yet, but hopefully we have equip contracts in Kansas in the next year or two. Texas uh, at some time was. So look into the cost share capabilities of this technology, um, it's it's readily there and readily available, and we're moving into states. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Like I said, we're working on Bermuda grass. Um, Eastern uh, Oklahoma and primarily Northeast Oklahoma educators two years ago did a lot of work in Bermuda grass, taking readings, taking cuttings. Uh, we're waiting on one particular area agronomist to get me back all his data. Been waiting about a year and a half on that one. And uh, once he gets that, we can put something together. It may look working with our new forage extension specialist to reinvigorate that Bermuda grass project and uh, let him run with it. Well, Amber, if there's no questions, I believe that is all I have this afternoon. Okay, fabulous. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, for everyone in attendance, the full video of this webinar will be available on our website in the next couple of days. Um, I will send out a message to everyone letting you know when we have that posted. Um, and we will be sending out an announcement about our October webinar um, early next month. So keep an eye out for that, I think. Otherwise, that's it for today. Thank you all so much for joining.